No. Are you guys putting in some tag grant applications? Yeah, this next month we were just getting all our ones completed for this last year. It was uh -huh. such a short period. Yeah, I know. It was, uh, I put mine in this yeah. one Friday. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to put some in. Yeah, yeah. Great. yeah. but our last one was yesterday. That one was really good. Okay. So, from 95 to 99, you guys have Where do you want us to stand? Thank you, Basilios. How's everyone doing this morning? Very good. It's wonderful to see everyone here on a Saturday morning. My name is Paul Ortiz. I'm a professor of history and I have the great privilege of directing the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Um, we're the main host and organizer of today's program, Future of Florida Springs, a discussion on spring health. I cannot imagine a more important and auspicious time to hold this public program. The Samuel Proctor Oral History Program has been involved in issues of water and the environment from the very beginning of the founding of our program in 1967 by Dr. Samuel Proctor. When I arrived here at UF and I taught at University of California, Santa Cruz for a number of years, but when I arrived in 2008, one of the most important projects that we had ongoing was a project where we were interviewing leaders and scientists who were involved in each of Florida's water management districts. That collection is accessible to the public. Um, I also had the, the great honor and privilege of doing a series of interviews with Mr. Nathaniel Reed uh, those of you familiar with the history of water and environment in the state will know that name. Uh, Mr. Reed was a really remarkable uh, individual uh, in terms of thinking about ways to protect the water and environment. So the Proctor Program, why are we holding the event today? Well, obviously the timeliness, the importance, the, the, even the, the sense of urgency to have this kind of public program. We have great speakers today. Um, I invite you to look at your, your program. In fact, it's, this is an amazing list of speakers. But as Vasilios was organizing this program, and by the way, let's give a round of applause to Vasilios for, for putting this together. Um, I'll say a few words about him in a moment, but as Vasilios and the Proctor program were putting this program together, uh, beyond just getting incredible speakers, such as our keynote speaker today, Dr. Steve Knoll, we realized that dialogue and discussion and listening, all of the skills that are paramount in oral history, that all these things would be just as important today as the quality and the quantity of our incredible list of speakers. Because this is an issue, water and the environment, where listening and dialogue and discussion are really vital um, at this point in the history of the state of Florida. Um, before I uh, give away uh, back to Vasilios and, and the platform, um, I do wanna say a few things about other programs and projects that are coming up that the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program is involved in. And by the way, uh, how many are first time visitors to Pew Hall? Very cool, welcome. Um, and so the Proctor Program has just the great honor of sharing the building with the Bob Graham Center for Public Service, the director is Dr. Matt Jacobs. Matt and I have known each other since we were in grad school. Uh, I was a grad student in the 1990s at Duke University, and I never held it against Matt that he was a grad student at UNC Chapel Hill at the same time because we both played basketball together on the Duke intramural basketball team. And we made it to the championship one year. And we almost won if it wasn't for those young, younger uh, ROTC kids, right? We came so close. But anyway, so we shared the building with uh, not only the Bob Graham Center, but also the languages um, colleagues upstairs in the top floor. So it's, this is a wonderful, vibrant part of the University of Florida. We're halfway between the football stadium and the library. It's the ideal place to be. But the Proctor Program has always been a student-driven research center. That's what makes us unique 
among our peer programs in the United States. So every major university has an oral history program, but I think what makes the Proctor program unique are people, students like Vasilios, and the fact that our students are field workers. They want to get out in the field. They want to talk to people. They want to talk to scientists. They want to talk to environmentalists. They want to talk to teachers, labor organizers, you know, anyone they can talk to. And one of our longstanding projects is actually the Virginia Tidewater Initiative. And we're working with Dr. Jessica Taylor, who now is an assistant professor of history at Virginia Tech University in Blacksburg, but back in the day was a grad, grad RA here at UF who led two different teams to the Virginia Tidewater to talk to fishing communities. Uh, this was t about eight or 10 years ago about the impact of a global climate change, um, the, the receding of, of coastal uh, uh, lands, and its profound impact on fishing in the, in the Tidewater. So we've always been interested in these types of projects, and I also want to invite all of you to, um, an, our next public program is on April 12th. It also will be here in Pew Hall, although we'll be back in the auditorium. And it's, the, it's a premiere of a film that tells a remarkable story. And I'll just give you the title of the film, tell you it's set in 1922, and right away you'll, you'll think, wow, what a story. So the title of the film is Oscar Mack versus the Ku Klux Klan. So that is a premiere film coming out and we'll have a hosting a public program April 12th at 5 p.m. here. And finally, I'd like to really invite you to just sign up onto our sign-up sheet and you'll get announcements for all of the upcoming public programs that we, that we partake in. And if you want to support the work of the oral history program, and don't worry, I'm not gonna ask for money, uh, but we would just like you to sign up just to keep in, in contact with us. And please feel free anytime to visit us in Pew Hall. Uh, we're just right upstairs. Our students love to talk to folks. And with that, um, I will kind of cede the, the platform to Vasilios again, but I just wanna say a few things about him. Um, Vasilios is one, I mean, I've been a university professor for 21 years. And Vasilios is one of the most remarkable students I've ever worked with. He is indefatigable. He has an endless reservoir of energy, a passion for research, and connecting research. We used to call this social action research, right? This idea that, yes, the basic research is the foundation of what we do, but then how do you apply it? And this is the, the puzzle that I think Vasilios has managed to solve, and this is kind of why we're all sitting here today. He graduated last year, he was a double major. Um, he's currently working with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. He has actually been accepted into the Peace Corps. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's really cool. Um, he also, I had the great honor to work with him through our colleagues at the Bob Graham Center. He received the Haskell Award last year, very prestigious undergraduate research award. So please join me in welcoming back to the, the platform, Vasilios Kosmikos. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz, for such a um, phenomenal welcoming address. My name is Vasilios Kosmikos, founder of the Florida Naturalist Project, and your host and moderator for this evening. Thank you all for joining us, and I'm, and I'm excited to bring a phenomenal program today. Um, last year, I started the Florida Naturalist Project as a senior. Over the course of a year and a half, I've conducted over 60 interviews from across the state, from the piano to the keys, interviewing a variety of stakeholders, ranging from politicians, scientists, fishermen, and everyday people to tell the story of Florida's waterways. This project explains how a variety of overlying factors contribute to the structure of these waterways and the cost they have on the individual's economic, environmental, and political, liv and political livelihoods. As I've, got, as I've gone across the state and I've, to gather a story of these waterways, I noticed a couple different motifs. And, but fundamentally, I noticed that the conversations, that, um, that through my conversations, that there's a lot of agreement that these waterways are getting destroyed. And it's, not over, and it's not happening over a matter of decades. In a lot of cases, it's happening over a matter of months and years. 
But through these conversations, I noticed a lot of, uh, even though I noticed a lot of agreement as to the urgency of the destruction of these waterways, I noticed that there's a lack of a general consensus of what's causing some of, of about what's causing their degradation, which is why we're here. Today's, um, the spirit of, of today is fundamentally about conversation and about discussion. Because, it's, because as a scientist, activist, leaders, and most importantly as individuals, it's cool, cool to remain objective as possible when analyzing, any issue, when analyzing any issue and to be cognizant of our emotions, the power structures and the biases that may alter the understanding. The word truth, you know, doesn't, in academic circles, isn't, is, tends to be a dirty word. You know, what is the truth? It's a very subjective thing. But I think, as, but I think all of us here, you know, no matter what we pursue, I mean, no matter what instance we're pursuing it, that's kind of what we're, you know, that's kind of what we're, kind of, that's kind of the goal of what we're doing, right? Whether we're scientists, whether we're activists, whether we're everyday people kind of going about our lives, we're all kind of, we're all going towards this ideal that we have, that this, you know, this platonic idea of goodness or of virtue, right? That's why we fight what we fight for, because we know that what's happened, that the system that is, that is, that does that exist today is not, producing what it should be producing. So, and so, excuse me, so, um, so, as, so again, right, the spirit to, um, of, of this event fundamentally has to do with, is one of communication and discussion and to encourage a breakup of tribalism that exists between different schools of thought. In the hyper-political world where nothing seems to be in touch from those of the vision, we owe it to ourselves to return to the days of into to return to the days of intellectual honesty and conversation where both people can disagree on an issue and walk away from a conversation and be a little better for it. Ultimately, I hope that our speakers and audience members alike will leave with a more open understanding of the issues and more likely to engage in conversation with someone that thinks differently. We don't, humankind is at its best when we sit and we discuss things together, when we smash ideas together and see what happens, no matter where it may lead. So thank you all. Thank you to our amazing. Um, so, so thank you to the, the amazing organizations that we have today: Care Problems, the Right to um, Florida, the Right to Clean Water, and the Florida Springs Institute for Tamling today. Thank you to our three wonderful um, workshop hosts: um, Dr. Sadie Hudimer, Hudim um, Linda Walensky, and Sandra um, and Sadie Poucher. And thank you to our wonderful list of panelists: Dr. Romer Knight, um, Dr. Matt Cohen, Greg Owens, and Merlin Malowitz Stripson for. Being being here for, um, for our panel, and to Dr. Steve Noll for giving our keynote address. Um, what do we do? Um, after, um, be, in about a minute, um, we, will, um, we will introduce Dr. Robert Knight to give the first um, of four presentations. What will happen is that Dr. Um, is that each um, panelist will give a 10 minute presentation on their respective perspective, on their pers respected perspective on spring health. They would then sit down, um, the next person will go up until all four presentations are done. Dr. Steve Knoll will give the keynote address. And finally, after Dr. the keynote address, there will be time for a Q&A portion. On your seats, there should be a piece of paper and a pencil, or if you don't have one, please, um, one of our volunteers will be more than happy to give you one. As you go throughout the event and you listen to different speakers, please write down your question, and then as we uh, enter that portion of the event, um, I will be, um, I will be, we'll be, we'll be conducting a Q&A portion. So with that being said, I welcome Dr. Robert Knight um, to uh, give the first of four presentations. Thank you, Dr. Robert Knight. That was a fantastic introduction for the Samuel Proctor Institute and for Vasilios, uh, the project he's been doing. He did, he did, did wonderful interviews. That The guy has really picked up on the subject well and asking a lot of questions that really bring out your knowledge about the issues. And so those are all online, right? All the interviews you did? You said there were 60 of them total? On, yeah, on water? Yeah, so I haven't seen all of them, but uh, I've, I've watched all the ones about springs, that's for sure. And they were, they were very well done, so thank you. Thanks, and, and thanks for inviting me today. Um, just a little background on me. I, uh, my dad was stationed at Jacksonville Naval Air Station in the 1950s. Uh, and so the first time I went to Silver Springs was 1953, same time that Howard Odom was doing his research there. I didn't meet him. Uh, I was more interested in the flamingos and the clear water and the catfish playing football than I was um, with Dr. Odom at that time. I didn't know about him. But um, years later, uh, I was a student at Chapel Hill. Uh, North Carolina studying um, 
uh, public health and environmental chemistry. And uh, I met Dr. Odom my very last semester of undergraduate school and took his systems ecology class at University of Florida and was just overwhelmed. I, I felt like I'd finally stumbled into a real college education. I, I, no, no course before that had as much influence on me as, as that. And then I got to work for Dr. Odom that summer at Moorhead City. Uh, in the fall, I followed him here to the University of Florida in 1970 and uh, stayed for one semester at that time as a graduate student. Finally went back to Chapel Hill to deal with some personal relationships and then came back here in 1977 under Dr. Odom, uh, who was ready to restudy Silver Springs. And I was the one selected to do that. So it was like, God, what a, a life made in heaven to have uh, the chance to go back and study 25 years after Dr. Odom had finished his study, study on Silver Springs. And I was an aquatic ecologist at that time, so I was really interested in the aquatic life of Silver Springs. That led then to a, a long career in consulting, environmental consulting, uh, designing treatment wetlands uh, all over the United States, and uh, eventually um, uh, getting hired uh, by the state of Florida to be their expert on springs, uh, because I'd had this previous experience with springs and had uh, continued on that line. So in 2002, I was hired to work on the uh, Volusia Blue Springs minimum flows and levels. Uh, to evaluate all the data for Volusia Blue to determine what kind of condition it was in and what kind of what would constitute harm at Volusia Blue, uh, which I did for a number of years. Uh, there was a very uncontroversial uh, MFL because it's the only MFL minimum flows and levels that they've ever done that said we're going to return the flows to historic flows. They've never done that anywhere else. They said, oh, well, we're just going to return to the historic flows as if they could do that while they're pumping groundwater all over central Florida. Uh, so, and then I got hired to study the recovery of Volusia Blue Springs while they were restoring the flows. And they kept me in that position for five years, uh, doing that research, documenting how the ecology was changing over time. The flows were not coming back. The flows still are not coming back to Volusia Blue. They never have, in spite of the state's promise to bring them back. Uh, but Volusia Blue's still sort of a healthy spring, although it has no vegetation other than algae. Uh, it's got elevated nitrate. It's got really elevated specific conductance. It's, it's closer to a dead spring, except that the water is still clear. Uh, it's almost an anaerobic spring. It's a spring that had really difficult time to start with. Its groundwater is very low oxygen. Um, and then I got hired to do the same thing for Wekaiva Springs. Uh, for uh, Rock Springs, for Alexander Juniper Springs, and then I got hired to do the 50-year retrospective study on Silver Springs. 50 years after Odom's original study, I got to go back and do another whole year of research on Silver Springs. And that then just led me to the realization our springs were all in trouble. Uh, the work I was doing was showing that we had problems in every one of these springs I was studying, and these were many of the major springs in Florida. I got a study, finally, of 13 individual large springs in Florida, and that was the last one the state paid for uh, because I started getting rather outspoken about the, the tragedy of losing these springs. And that's a prelude to this presentation. I started the Florida Springs Institute in 2010 to provide a platform for calling for changes and for educating the, the state in terms of what was happening and also to stand up as an expert when needed uh, to uh, testify in legal proceedings. I, in, in between there, I taught springs ecology here at University of Florida for s over a six-year period. And so I've had a lot of a long background. Uh, it's a very frustrating last uh, 20 years of my life uh, as I continue to study the springs. The Springs Institute is continuing to research. Uh, last year, we conducted a year-long research study of floor four uh, large spring state parks on the Suwannee River, Lafayette Blue, uh, Troy Springs, Fanning, and Manatee. Uh, two of those springs were essentially dead with no life other than algae, uh, no fish, no fauna, uh, no clear water. Most of the time, no people recreating in them because they were tannic water. Uh, Fanning was not quite as bad, but definitely going down. And then um, uh, Manatee is still sort of alive. So. That's what we're doing. We just finished a study on rainbow that indicates that rainbow is actually fairly healthy right now because of high rainfall the last few years. And, uh, and this is a picture of rainbow, which I, in the past I've given a low grade to. But let me just read through my prepared remarks. Um, so 
starting with Odom, Dr. Odom in the 1950s and continuing to the current day, we have a really clear idea of what's happening ecologically in our springs. The attributes and indicators of springs health include physical factors such as flow volume, temperature variation, and water clarity, chemical factors such as dissolved oxygen, specific conductance, and nitrate, and biological responses such as plant community composition, faunal populations, and ecosystem productivity. Those are the structural and functional aspects of springs that make a living spring. And this is a picture of a living spring. Rainbow right now is, a, is one of the most beautiful springs in the state of Florida. But based on more than 40 years of quantitative data, uh, which I pulled together a few years ago, we published a detailed summary of changing health indicators. And this is an executive summary of that Florida Con Springs Conservation Plan. It's on our table back there, and they're free. Those, these plans are free to you back there. I hope everybody will take one. We brought enough for everybody. Um, what we did was rate 32 sentinel springs, springs that had over 40 years of data. And they're, at over 1,000 springs in Florida, it was hard finding 40 springs that have any kind of data set that's over, over a long enough period to see these trends. And A indicates a rating of very good and recommended intervention response to ecologically, uh, of an ecologically desirable status requires minimal intervention or maintenance. So we would like our springs to all be A's. Uh, sl uh, can I have the next slide? Am I in charge of that? Oh, I did not do that. Okay, so you guys have been watching the slides ahead of me. And F indicates a rating of failed, a, rec a recommended intervention of primary spring functions, very low or absent. The functions, that's the productivity, the secondary, primary productivity, all those. The restoration, increasingly difficult, may result in extirpation of the spring and our associated species and requires immediate and holistic intervention. Well, the results of the analysis confirmed what we already knew and what we could all see with our own eyes. Um, no, none of the springs, the 32 sentinel springs, received a grade above B+. Plus. Half of the sentinel springs had a D plus or lower. Uh, and 75% were re relate, uh, uh, graded as B minus or less. And B minus is really not accessible, the, uh, acceptable. Uh, a B minus is basically, these are, these are almost all outstanding Florida waters in Florida. They're supposed to have the highest level of protection. And many now are outstanding Florida springs, another level of protection, supposedly. But the springs located in East Central Florida, like Silver, in southwest Florida, uh, like Rainbow and, and Crystal River, and along the Suwannee Santa Fe rivers are the most imperiled due to human activities. Many of these springs are prominent centerpieces within state and county parks. A few notable springs outside of these most affected areas, including Jackson Blue and Wakulla in the Panhandle, and uh, Kaiva in the Upper St. John's are also severely imperiled. Finally, the proximal causes of these excessive springs impairments are well known and human mediated. We know this. This is not new information at all. Groundwater extractions have depleted spring flows by more than one third on average. They've lost more than one third of their flow on average. And by more than that during drought years, much more, maybe 40 or 50%. Silver's flow went down to about one third of its flow in 2012. Nitrate contamination in the Florida aquifer is due to the wasteful use of inorganic urban fertilizer, urban and agricultural fertilizers on vulnerable karst areas and poor management of animal and human wastewaters. Think septic tanks, think wastewater spray fields, um, think dairies. Uh, excessive human rec recreation, dams, think uh, Rodman Dam and seawalls add to the toll on springs ecological harm. Analysis of the human Groundwater footprint, that's the combination of groundwater extraction and pollution on all the properties in the 27 million acre Florida Springs region. That was 400,000 properties that we did a, the GIS analysis on. Indicates that relatively small group of corporations and private individuals are responsible for the greatest share of the impacts on Springs health. We're talking about um, 5% or 3% of the populations responsible for 90% of the problems. Next slide. But the documented and worsening ecological health of Florida's priceless springs provides ample evidence that Florida's political leadership is not working to fix these problems. Much of the tax dollars that are being directed to springs protection are in fact 
spent on projects that have had no measurable impacts on springs. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars that are supposedly going to springs protection. That money's going into people's pockets. Springs health impairments continue to worsen every passing year. It's, this is an unacceptable fate for Florida's most unique and precious natural resources and present, present, presents a clear danger for the sustainability of the Florida aquifer. Everyone I know loves springs and they all see springs differently, but nobody uh, that's looked at springs sees that they're healthy now. Uh, and I'm sure you'll hear that from the other speakers. Please feel empowered to do something about this problem. This is a horrific problem for the future of Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robert Knight. Now, um, if Matt Cohen, please come up. Thank you. So my name is Matt Cohen. I'm faculty here at the University of Florida. Um, I'm in the School of Forest, Fisheries, and Geomatic Sciences. And I was also fortunate enough to cross paths with H.T. Odom as a graduate student. In fact, I was H.T. Odom's last PhD student before he passed away. Um, and so I think both Bob and I were cut from the same cloth, which is listening to Odom, um, his sort of uh, capacious mind taking stock of, of complex systems and, and, and passing that skill on to his students, I hope. Um, so what I wanted to start with today is a little bit of a, a couple of quotes that I, I share with my graduate students um, because I feel like they really sort of center us as scientists. Um, so the first one, uh, many of you will recognize the names, Carl Sagan said that the tension between creativity and skepticism and what produces the, the insights and, and uh, um, and uh, findings of science. And that is to say, we have to cultivate as scientists our sense of skepticism. I think it's a, it's a crucial ingredient. Um, the second is uh, by a, a fellow named Randall Monroe, which many of you might know is the producer of XKCD, who has a quote in one of my favorite comics that says, you don't use science to show that you're right, you use science to become right. And so when presented with evidence about which you're skeptical, I think you're honor bound to adopt this sort of approach articulated in 1897 by Thomas Chamberlain. I didn't put his picture up there just because he can rock some facial hair. Um, but because, this is a ge geologist, but because I think this quote actually embodies one of the most important features of being a scientist, which is that we can't place our reasonings, we can't place our lofty ideals um, above the facts that are presented to us. And so I want to tell you a little bit about a narrative that I've been on that's been trying to wrestle with some facts and in, t in particular negotiate that through this method of multiple working hypotheses, which for me is really the sort of fundament of good science. So I'm going to start with this. Why are we here? We're here because our springs, as Bob just articulated, have, been, have degraded. There has been a state change in many of our springs. Rainbow, Silver, the Upper Chituckney, there's a number of springs that I think look close to what they might have historically, but a lot of our springs look like this. This is Devil's Eye on the Chituckney, then and now, picture series by John Moran. Um, this is a picture of, of an algal bloom in a spring. This is a picture of the vascular plant beds that we're looking for. And so this is the problem that we're identifying. But why am I here? And that I think the reason I'm here is because Vasilios heard in our interview the idea that I'm skeptical of the idea that nitrate is the fundamental cause of these changes. And I'm going to show you a little bit of data. I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm kind of a nerd. You're going to have to look at some graphs. I'm sorry. Um, this is one graph. This is a study that DEP did where they related nitrate concentrations to algal cover. And that's the relationship between them. It has an R squared of 0 0.01, which is not very descriptive. And it gave me pause because my early career was looking at nitrate, trying to understand the aquifer, understand the sources of nitrate. The state drew its line for the, the MFL at that level, 0 0.35 milligrams per liter. So that is one line of evidence that gave me some pause, activated maybe a little bit of a red flag skeptic. These two pictures, this is from Silver River, which is running at about 1.4 milligrams per liter, so roughly four times the background, the, the, ex, the desirable number. And this is from Alexander Springs, which is sitting at 0 0.04, so way below the standard. So clearly, I can cherry pick pictures, um, but that's one sort of line of evidence. We've gone, I've written, I counted, in, for this talk. I can, I've written tw 17 papers about the springs, many of them sort of assimilating data. And this is one that, that we've done where we related the primary production that Bob was talking about, total photosynthesis in the spring to nitrate, and there's no relationship. There's no relationship between then and now. Some of those are Odom's data. In fact, Odom, in one of his most famous papers in the 50s, said nitrate doesn't matter for, for photosynthesis in the springs. What, what matters is light. 
And the plants have been telling us this all along and we just weren't listening. So this is how plants look. This is what was on this x-axis is the relationship between the resources available to plants. So think nitrogen and phosphorus. And this is, in particular is the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus. And this is how the plants grow. And when plants are nutrient limited, they grow in response to the environment. So the environment changes and the plants change their recipe. These are the data from the springs, from two species of algae and in fact two species of vascular plants. There's no relationship. The plants have been telling us all along they don't, they're not limited by nitrogen. And I think this is a crucially important point because as Bob mentioned, there's a lot of money that's on the table should be directed at the most effective ways of intervening to solve this state change that we observe in our springs. And if nitrate's not that thing, we need some alternative working hypotheses. So what are some alternative hypotheses? Well, this is a picture of my student, Dina Leibowitz in Mill Pond Spring in Ishituckney. And she did her dissertation looking at the roles of top-down controls, that is to say grazers, the things that eat algae. And this is it, this is one of the key players, Alemia floridensis, is Florida rasp. And what she showed is that if she counts up all the snails in a site and relates it to the algal biomass that she observed, there's a pretty strong negative relationship, more snails, less algae. She did that experimentally, and as she added, experimentally added snails to some um, in situ mesocosms, the algae went away. I can show you a bunch of data, but that's the picture. Here's where she enclosed, imprisoned some rasps in some experimental flumes and it should tuck these springs. This is where she kept them out. And so the, the ecological consequence of the, the accumulation of algal biomass in the absence of grazers is really quite strong. Now there's lots of reasons why this, there are counter lines of evidence and if we had all day, I'd keep going and you'd probably fall asleep, but there's, there's you know, like all narratives, there's evidence for and against this, but the, the grazer hypothesis I think has some pretty strong support, both this and some recent work. One of the things we noticed is that the, we can sort of now interview snails and ask them what makes them happy. And it turns out oxygen is one of the most important ingredients for assessing the, the happiness of snails. Um, so this is dissolved oxygen. This is essentially these gray lines are the probability of seeing enough snails to graze the algae that's there. So when the oxygen's really low, you just never find those kinds of densities. And it's only when the oxygen's high, like the picture of Rainbow River. Rainbow looks really good because Rainbow River comes out of the ground really high oxygen. Um, so the oxygen hypothesis is a picture from Margaret Tolbert, the Song of Gaia. Gaia was the idea that the planet is essentially uh, a giant meta-organism that produces oxygen. I thought it'd be a nice photo to put in the back here. Oxygen in the springs has been used by Odom since the 1950s to sort of assess the function. There's this up and down wiggling of nitrate, dot dissolved oxygen. We can think of oxygen as like the heartbeat of this ecosystem. High oxygen confers a lot of benefits to plant growth. It confers benefits to animals who depend on dissolved oxygen to live. And the oxygen concentrations are also changing. This is a data set from comparing a bunch of springs in 1972 with those same thing, springs in 2002 with this threshold of about two milligrams per liter below which a lot of aquatic organisms can no longer use that habitat. So there's an important connection between this grazer control and this, the oxygen story. Greg Owen, who's gonna talk right after me, so I'm totally stealing his thunder. We thought we were gonna talk in different order, but he did an experiment, this bold experiment where he said, let's add some oxygen to spring. And when he did that, when he did that, the red lines here are, this is basically plant growth over time. The red lines are where we added oxygen. The blue lines are where we didn't add oxygen to this experiment in Hornsby Spring. And it was just remarkable the degree to which oxygen increases transformed that spring. And notably, when we added oxygen and snails together in concert in this experiment, the ecosystem flourished in a way that was beyond what we could have possibly expected. Likewise, when we added oxygen and added snails, the algal accumulation was essentially interrupted. It didn't accumulate any algae, whereas when we didn't do that, this particular experiment demonstrated that that ecosystem was accumulating a ton of algae. So there's support for this oxygen hypothesis. I'm gonna go ahead and skip this one. The work that we're, that we're doing now is about this idea that on a lot of the springs that connect to rivers, the river water, this brown water, will rise up during floods and press back into the spring, push into the aquifer, and make the springs dark. Excuse me, dark. So we're able to basically build a time machine to reconstruct the incidence of these events throughout the Suwannee River. So for example, we can add up all the flow at these upper locations and compare it to the flow downstream. We can do that from Ellaville to Branford. We can do it from Fort White to Wilcox. We can do it from Worthington. So we're basically building little uh, 
um, reaches of the river. And when we do that, we can sum up all the flow that we attribute to springs. So this is, now just note the dates. This starts in 1932. So we're basically able to construct, reconstruct springs flow from 1932 to the, to the end of 2022. And what I'm showing you is something called the cumulative anomaly. So like when it's going up, means the springs flow is increasing. And when it's going down, it means the springs flow is decreasing. And I don't think you need a lot of statistical analysis to note that somewhere in here, right around 1990, maybe 1998 is the year, um, I'll argue, and basically across all four of those reaches, we see dramatically declining springs flow. This basically corresponds to about 1,500, collectively 1,500 cubic feet per second of missing springs flow on the Suwannee River. And so I think there's an area of really strong agreement between Bob, what Bob was saying before and, and what we've been finding. This is the cumulative incidence of those reversals. Um, those reversals aren't changing. In most of the springs runs, we don't see more reversals except for the upper springs run. So think Madison Blue Spring in the upper Suwannee. But there's this phenomenon where the springs don't necessarily reverse, but they turn brown. We call them dark days, brownout days, right? If you spend any time around the springs, you've seen this happen. It happens a lot in Fanning Springs. It happens a, a little bit less in the Santa Fe Springs. But here we have time series showing that those brownouts were quite rare in all of those springs reaches through the first 70 years of our record. And there's been this just massive increase, a nearly, um, so an increase of more than doubling the annual incidence of these brown days in the springs since about 1990. This is almost certainly related to flow, but it's also something that we, you know, we need to better understand. Has it related to the land use change in the upper watershed? We don't know. Um, just to show you the effects of these brownouts, the brownouts, this is a brownout on Allen Mill Pond. We saw brownouts where the oxygen level dropped for three weeks in a row. This ecosystem just got crushed. And just to show you what happens, this is Gilchrist Blue Springs during Hurricane Irma before, right here on the 12th of September, and after, two weeks later, because of this brownout event. These are super important events for our springs, and the incidence appears to be changing. All right, so with that, I'm just going to wrap up and say I have questions right, about what things we need to know in order to be effective stewards of these resources. Why are the populations of grazers changing? What is making these dark days increase? The mechanisms of that remain a little bit mysterious to me. And maybe most importantly, why do we see variation in oxygen in space and in time in the aquifer? Because until we can crack that nut, there's not very much we can do to replicate the kind of results that Greg Owen saw when he put bubblers in the spring. I don't know why there's so little oxygen in some of these springs and others that have a lot. So with that, I'm out of time, and I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Barkhill. And now, if uh, Greg Owens can come to stand, that'll be great. Greg Owens. Okay, yeah, thank you. I'm Greg Owen. I'm with the Lachin County Environmental Protection Department. And I was also a student of Matt Cohen's, as he mentioned. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about some springs specific projects that I've done, as well as some of the larger um, tools that Alachua County uses for springs restoration and then end up with some conclusions. And while I might not have the same scientific expertise as Bob and Matt or the same uh, historical knowledge that Mary Lee and, and others have, I have been on these springs for a long time. I grew up uh, in the 90s paddling the Itchitakni and then graduated to the back of the boat on the Suwannee. So I've seen changes through time. And when we're thinking about like how springs change, it's important to capture those sort of baselines. We've heard a lot about springs degradating over time. And while there's statewide, there's a lot of data to document the transition of springs from that iconic eelgrass to being covered in algae, there really wasn't a lot of documentation in this area. I work for Alachua County, so I'm really focused on the springs of the Santa Fe River. And this was something that we knew we needed. So we started a survey of between 14 and 16 springs on the Santa Fe, all the way from up at Treehouse Rise, Columbia Rise, going down to Sawdust Springs. And we started this in 2017. You'll note that 
Matt mentioned this as well. This is what Gilcrest Blue Springs looked like in 2017. So we went down the runs of all these springs. We took videos, photo documentations. We had biologists documenting all the plants. Then in 2017, after Hurricane Irma, this is what the same spring looked like. But we kept going out after 2017. We've done this now. We just finished 2021. This is what the spring looked like in 2020. So we're able to see some of that recovery. This is really important because it lets us know what springs are resilient and which may not be. Establishing those baselines and understanding that, that biological makeup helps us understand the health of the springs. One other thing that was missing was understanding the fauna of some of these really hard to access areas. This is a picture in Mill Creek Sink. So this actually drains to Hornsby Springs, one of our springs in the Santa Fe. And we sent cave divers down into a number of locations across the spring shed, including this one, to see what are the troglobitic species. Troglobitic are like cave adapted species and troglophilic. And we were able to expand the, the range of some of these species in order to kind of understand the health um, and set a baseline, because some of these places had never been visited before. And it kind of makes me think of Horton here as a who, right? Like we got to think about even the smallest creatures. If we can protect this little cave crayfish, we'll have a better chance of protecting the springs as a whole. Now, I had this thought like, hey, we're missing plants. Let's put plants in. Post Springs is owned by Alachua County. So one of the projects I did, we went in, we said, we'll build it, right? The little guys will come and we'll restore the springs. I, snorkeled down and put in the tape grass that we like to see. Well, some people came, um, or some things came, a lot of the turtles came and, and ate down those plants. And you can see no plants survived. Um, interestingly, Poe Springs is one of those low DO springs, um, but it also is low in nitrates. So it's not impaired for nutrients, but because there isn't that dissolved oxygen there to support the, the grazers or to support the plants that need oxygen in order to grow, it really wasn't a suitable site for a restoration. And that led me to that next question that Matt was talking about. What makes a good springs restoration, right? How are we gonna, how are we gonna smartly spend our funds. And so I wanted to, to investigate this question a little more closely and look at different restoration actions that we might use in a springs restoration project. Things like putting plants in and removing algae because those are common activities. And then we are particularly interested in dissolved oxygen, right? Because it was a good predictor of the health and the coverage of algae in our springs. So we put in pumps and we actually elevated that oxygen. We got it to something similar that we would see at Gilchrist Blue Springs. Hornsby Springs is naturally very low. And then we, we were interested in that interaction with the grazers. So we stalked snails as well to densities that we had seen on the Itchituckney River. And the results, I'm not going to show you any data slides here, but I will show you some pictures so you can see what happens. This is one of the plots that, that gets all the treatments. So this had plants in it, snails, and algae removed in the beginning. And you can see it over time. The snails are dead now at 17 days. They can't survive at the low oxygen levels. The sulfuric bacteria is coming in, and the algae starts to take over 102 days. This was over a year-long project. So by 340 days, there's maybe three or four plants that are left in this plot. Now let's compare that with the elevated oxygen and see what happens. The, the algae is staying kind of stable, but our plants are starting to grow and really take off. By 340 days, these plants have reproduced. There's 35 or 40 plants in this plot by the end. If you have really good eyes, you can see that there's actually some snail eggs on some of those leaf blades, and they've flowered. By the way, that, that little tile in the middle, we were not just looking at the growth of plants over time, but we wanted to measure the growth of algae. So we actually scraped those clean, and that was some of the grass that Matt showed, where there was also a significant effect of dissolved oxygen on the growth of algae. And then when you paired that with you know, the elevated oxygen levels in the snails, we saw even less biomass of algae occurring over time. 
So it's not just at the springs where Alachua County is working, although I like splashing around and doing my science out in the springs. We do a lot of work upstream. Alachua County has a mix of regulatory and kind of behavioral changes. So on the regulatory end, Alachua County has started to take a lead in putting in a fertilizer ban certain times of the year where you're not allowed to put out fertilizers. We also have a point of sale signage. Any store that is selling fertilizers, they have to have something that says, hey, you're in the blackout period. You know, you're not supposed to be applying this between December and February. Uh, we also have irrigation restrictions. This is one of the first things I did when I worked for the county, where we actually would drive around. We did enforcement of there's certain days that you're allowed to water, only certain hours. And in those communities that we had driven in, we saw a big decrease, not just by the people that we sent warning letters to for watering on the wrong day, but the rest of the neighborhood in response. And we know this is really important because the springs are connected to the same water that we're using here. So in surveys, we found out that like 55% over the half of people didn't realize that the water they're using from their tap on their lawns is the same water that feeds our springs. And we knew there are certain behavioral changes that we, we wanted to have people to use less water. So we had to connect people to their water. And this is kind of part of our social marketing campaign. Stacy Greco, my supervisor, has worked on this a lot. This picture on, on the left, you can see this is actually one we worked on with the Springs Institute. Recreational impacts is a big thing in our springs. So if we can teach people to have their feet up and float and let them think about like, oh, we need to, to save those plants. Um, we also ran a number of billboards and television ads. Here's an example of one of the billboards connecting people to their spring, our springs, our water. And you can see the divide there. What else is to come? Alachua County, we're looking at doing an irrigation efficiency code. Um, just restricting the number of days isn't enough. We've seen a number of houses are getting built here. And every new house comes with an irrigation system. I think it's 90% of homes are built with an irrigation system. We know that 60% of water usage is outside on your lawn. So if we can limit that, then that's one of those kind of low hanging fruits that we can allow more water to come out of the springs. It's something that we really want to see change. We also have a septic rebate program coming where we're, we're offering money to to people that want to upgrade their septic. They can get up to $5,000 to replace it with advanced treatment septic, septic and treat that nutrients before it makes it to the springs. Thanks. Uh, I guess in conclusion, what I want to get across is there's really no one simple solution to our springs. It's, we're all rely on this we all rely on it for our drinking water. 90% of Floridians are drinking from a Florida aquifer. And it's gonna take all of us working together collaboratively to have some, any sort of meaningful impact to our springs. Thank you, Greg Owen. And last but not least, Marilyn Mellitz Gibson. Thanks, Vasilios. Okay, how's everyone today? Get everybody uh, some, uh, how many of you have been to the Springs? Okay, glad to hear that. Sometimes I ask the audiences and only a couple of handfuls go up. So I am going to uh, hopefully move through mine rather quickly. Okay, Marilyn Malwitz Gibson. I am a board member, founding member with our Santa Fe River. Photographs of how I live on the river with my kids and my husband and now I've them there, okay. Uh, homeschooling, being at home, all those kind of wonderful things. Um, we actually had science classes at Rum, Rum uh, Island Park for a while with homeschool kids to teach them science based on people that I was meeting in the field. Uh, we visited a lot of springs and then our Santa Fe River got formed over four bottling plants. This is Martha Strawn in the red shirt. She is actually the founder member. The other one is uh, Kristen Rubin, who is here with us today. We were a grassroots organization that actually sat at kitchen tables in people's living rooms and decided that we needed to do something about four bottling plants that were coming into the Santa Fe River. So we organized weekly. 
We had tabling events. We had public outreach events in community centers, uh, extremely active organizations since 2006, technically. 2007 is when we became a board. Uh, we have a hotline phone number. People call us when we have issues. This one I'm going to stop if I can. Anyway, so we, uh, one of the first meetings we attended was with the water management district. And the director, who's coming up here in this, uh, right here, next one, director told us, Jerry Scarborough, that we needed to change laws, that we needed uh, Chapter 373, then the Water Resource Act, here we go, and we needed to understand how to change the laws, and we took that to heart. We actually attend uh, working group meetings, we attend uh, government meetings, we um, learn from the experts like you heard today. This is how I met several of the experts today actually, was going to working group me meetings in the field. We go to the IFAS Research Center north of Live Oak. That is an amazing place if you've never seen it. We learned about these pumps that High Springs has for their wastewater. We went to the Valdosta wastewater. I mean, all we do is attend, go, see. We do so much of that because of the work that we do to stop harm from happening to the Santa Fe River. And with that in mind, uh, we, we actually have been winning things lately, which is an extraordinary place to be, uh, winning different uh, land use issues. Uh, this is my business. This is where our Santa Fe River is housed. I don't know how many of you rent equipment, but this is a creative out, uh, center where we use music, theater, uh, fine arts. Uh, every type of art that you can think of, we use at our business to actually uh, impress upon people how important the springs and rivers are. Um, we actually have gallery shows with well-known artists. We even use, uh, um, not use, I'm sorry. We even invite uh, the Fort White High School kids, which is near us, to come in and actually show with us too. So they also have this experience of learning about culture and arts uh, as, it, as it affects the river. See, will that stop it? No, it won't stop it. So the springs can be really ugly like the last photo you just saw. They can be really pretty. So here, I'm actually concerned where, where we're looking at the um, river itself, we see marks on the trees. And these marks on the trees, some of the experts that I've talked to are saying, oh, it's from flooding. But it's such a distinct mark that we see on the trees. Now it's working, okay. That um, we see it on other trees. She's, uh, uh, Terry here is checking the uh, gauges on the river, and this, uh, these are the concerns that we're also having is erosion. So where these marks are also located on the trees, um, we're seeing erosion from motorized traffic, from flooding, but those marks mean something, and I don't know what they mean, but this is what's happening. All these trees are starting to fall into the river because of erosion issues from overhuman usage, which is what you're seeing there, overhuman usage, which is what you're seeing here, including flooding. Our organization also uh, uh, is an activist organization. So we protest, or we used to protest. <laughs> can't protest anymore the way the governor's uh, moving. But uh, we used to have demonstrations all the time. Here we are protesting the uh, gas transmission line that goes under the, under the river. Interviews with lots of TV, lots of uh, um, radio, uh, also in print. Here's Bob Knight even uh, protesting with us uh, for right to clean water, um, protesting for fracking in downtown. We, we just do so much outside activity trying to raise attention and awareness about our springs. Um, we're one of the more active groups in that manner uh, of trying to get the word out using either social media or uh, demonstrations. Uh, this is against the recent Nestle or Seven Springs Water Company permit for bottling. Uh, we were really effective with a lot of the work we did. We got over 19,000 comments in a government portal, which was pretty extraordinary. This is a John Moran photograph of the youth involved with one of the High Springs demonstrations. We meet with state agencies. We've met with uh, the newest director of the DEP and the Water Management District. Um, we speak, like I said earlier, in front of all kinds of government meetings, Marion County, Alachua County, any county that has some sort of water use issue and that we can address them, we will go and we will speak out. Uh, this is actually in Lake County. Uh, 
this is the governor's office when we're turning in some fracking uh, petitions. And this is in Tallahassee where we speak out in committee hearings and also uh, meet other organizers from across the state of Florida that are doing the same things. And I bring my kids. I bring my kids, or used to when they were small and didn't know any better. <laughs> but I bring them to these things because it's important. It's important that you all understand where your voice is and where it matters and getting involved in Tallahassee or on the local level with your water issues. This was the scene die day. It was a crazy day that day. Oh, attending, uh, if anybody wants to be really active, attending county or city uh, governmental uh, 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 activities such as this. This is a, um, like a, a workshop of a sense that, that you can actually go and attend and speak out on. Class B biosolids used to happen on this site. I worked with the property owner, owner to stop that. This was the cyanobacteria that was on our river. That's how our river looked for a little while. And we had uh, filamentous algae that uh, Matt was speaking about earlier. Uh, working with reporters again and photographers to get the word out. Uh, motorized activity on the Santa Fe River is becoming a real nuisance these days. Uh, this is at the uh, Rainbow uh, Wiki Wachi for Springs Protection Zone. This is the 47 Bridge to fix it up. These were all the people responsible for trying to get 47 Bridge fixed up. LIDAR, we love LIDAR, light detecting and imaging. That stuff is the bomb. It tells you exactly where the water is coming from, where it's going. These were the residents that stopped the Union County, Bradford County, Phosphate mining committee, I, I'm sorry, phosphate mining um, that they were going to be doing in those counties. This is how much land that was going to be phosphate mined on top of the new river. Phosphate mining is such a big thing right now. They're trying to put phosphogypsum in the roads. We're trying to stop that too up in Tallahassee. Cleaning up sinkholes. We clean up sinkholes because that is our connection to the groundwater. And the worst thing that's happening right now that we're witnessing is the destruction of wetlands. And this is the final. I believe that's the final one. So destruction of wetlands is a really big problem because we're seeing more and more housing development. And we're seeing more people moving to North Florida from coastal communities because they have saltwater intrusion or whatever problems they have along the coastline. And they're coming here because everybody's so nice. And the taxes are so cheap. And there's so many trees that they can cut down. <laughs> So uh, we're trying to um, uh, educate people about trees and how uh, trees do matter when it comes to uh, water and how much water is in the basin. Because as you know, if you stand in the sunlight, you won't last very long. But if you stand in the shade, you could last all day. So um, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest right there. And um, we'll take questions or whatever later. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gibson, for a wonderful presentation. I now invite Dr. Noll to give the keynote address. Thank you. And also, um, there's a piece of paper um, for you guys to write any questions. If you guys can just hand them to the end of the aisle, we'll be picking them up for the Q&A portion at the event shortly. Okay. I'm not here by myself. I brought my friend, Hugh. Hugh Manatee. And Hugh is, is kind of the, Hugh is the poster child, poster animal, from um, our summer programs, which we ran from 2016 to 2019, called uh, Humanities and the Sunshine State, which is about taking high school students one week, taking high school teachers and elementary school teachers another week, and explaining to them all about Florida and water. Matt was there as part of the program. Bob Knight was there for part of the program. Um, it's been a remarkable uh, success. Some of those students are now graduating from the University of Florida, and they have been involved in all sorts of, of things, including water, um, and including the Samuel Proctor Oral History um, Program itself. And Hugh remains with me. So um, he was at the dean's office, but uh, he's better off with me than with the dean. So, um, <laughs> so um, this is called Florida Springs, A Personal Journey. Um, it's about my association with Springs as a Florida resident, but also as a historian. Um, and much of what you will see uh, has already been talked about. Not as good as I'm going to talk about it, but it's been talked about. Um, so let's start with um, my experiences. I come to Florida in 1974 from uh, New York and then from went to college in Virginia. Come down here with um, a college friend. We both are going to graduate school. And we decide. I've heard about this place, this Itchituckney place. Uh, sounds cool. Let's go. So on a Saturday in maybe October, 
we drove from Gainesville up to up to um, you know Fort White and rented a tube and got tons of beer and went out there and and um, we were shocked when the Rangers said, "Hey, buddy, you can't bring beer in this river." So, being good college students, we were pissed off. Right? We were pissed off, and about. We got in the tubes and started floating down, and about halfway down, we said, we understand why there's no beer allowed on this river. I said, this is amazing. You know, and it's, it's you know, coming from New York, coming from Long Island, which is you know, paved, paved over. Um, this is remarkable. This place was remarkable. And that kind of began my association with the Springs as um, someone who thought that they were remarkable and wonderful and very, very different than kind of any place that we've been. And certainly one of the places that um, we started canoeing on is um, the Santa Fe and stopping at Poe, which at this point was privately owned. And um, there's Poe. And um, 1978, four years after I came here, I had just gotten married and uh, got married in Orlando, came back up here to get ready to go on our honeymoon, which was going to be camping in the Virgin Islands. Um, and my college roommate from Oregon was with us. And so he said, let's go somewhere. So we went to Poe, you know, uh, off a dirt road, off of the um, off of High Springs. And we're there. And Poe is beautiful. And it showed us just how fragile these places are. Because we're there, and there's nobody else there. There's no, you know, there's no, like Poe now has that, has the concrete stuff. There's nothing like that. And there's nobody there. All of a sudden, here comes some guy driving his cab of a semi up the truck, up the road. I figured, oh, he's going to stop. No, he drives it into the spring itself. So the water's like halfway up on the, on the, um, the, big tires, gets out and lies on the hood of the thing. And I just said, this is why we need to protect places like this. I said, this is just remarkably awful, right? So uh, again, opportunities to protect. And then this is Juniper. Um, and every time people from New York, including my parents, would come down. My, now my mother, understand, my mother's a New Yorker, man. Outside is bad, right? <laughs> you know, it's just bad. But we took her um, at, at canoe at, at, from, from Jenny at that point. She was like amazed. She said, this water's clear. I said, yeah, it's not New York, Mom. Yes, it's clear. And so friends of ours came from New York, who, um, and we took them to Juniper, you know, because we had taken most people to the, the Santa Fe River. We'll go to a different one. And Juniper was a remarkable place as well. You can see how clear. And we went there. and. Uh, we got into some interesting stuff that tells us nature can be a little unforgiving. So we went, we went down the Juniper Run, which is remarkable. If you haven't, any, anybody kayaked or canoed Juniper? It's amazing, right? It's amazing. So um, we went about halfway down. It started thundering. So, shit. so we turned around and heading back towards the spring head. And um, there's four people in, in this canoe, you know, myself, my wife, and the, the other New York couple. And, you know, there's an overhanging tree branch and the, the, the woman in the front pushes it away and man yellow jackets like crazy oh my god all over her you know the horror movie right there you know dumped it dumped it in the water I had to this was maybe 10 minutes from the spring head luckily the water was incredibly cold and wonderful so um but that tells us you know nature is not always just wonderful but but it, Today, I'm still in contact with these people, and they say, you know, that was a horrible experience, but Juniper was wonderful. So that's, that's, that's kind of where we're going to start with. And now we're going to switch roles from my um, personal experiences with Springs to my experience as a historian of Florida. Um, and, you know, when we talk about Florida and we talk about the Springs, we have to start with the mythology of Ponce de Leon. Because he comes here, we all know, which we all know it's nonsense, right? He all comes here to find the fountain of youth, right? And, you know, in the late 19th century into the mid 20th century, places that have springs all wanted to market those springs as the place where Ponce de Leon found the fountain of youth, right? So this is, this is um, at the place in... Um, St. Augustine called Fountain of Youth Park, you know, and you got this thing. So it tells us that even in the 16th century, people were amazed and enthralled by the possibilities of what's happening here with these springs. And certainly for the next four centuries, um, foreigners, 
Northerners, Europeans, come to Florida and are enchanted by the springs themselves. So we're going to look at, certainly we all know who these guys are, I think. This is William Bartram, Philadelphia naturalist, comes down here first with his father in the 1760s, then by himself in the 1770s, and writes you know, this wonderful book. Um, It'll take you an hour to read the whole title, but it's basically called uh, William Bartram's Travels. And William Bartram's Travels is this remarkable, um, remarkable compendium of knowledge about Florida when it was um, a, a British colony. And uh, much of what we know about what Florida looked like during this time period uh, comes from Bartram's Travels. And much of, of the um, of the romantic poetry of like uh, William Wordsworth and Samuel Coleridge come from reading the discussions of this strange land that William Bartram, that William Bartram uh, visited. And so um, I'm going to read from his travels, which was published in the 1790s, but written in 1774. Uh, this, and this is about what will become known as Volusia Blue Spring. This creek, which is formed instantly by this admirable fountain, is wide and deep enough for a sloop to sail up into the basin itself. The water is perfectly diaphanous, and there are constantly a prodigious number and variety of fish. They appear as plain as though lying on a table before your eyes, although many feet deep in the water. A pale bluish or pearl-covered coagulum covers inanimate substances that lie in the water, like logs and limbs of trees. Alligators and gar are numerous in the basin. And there's Volusia Blue today, um, known mostly for uh, its wintertime residents, Hughes Buddies. Right? So Bartram is, is a catalyst for people to examine these springs and, and tell us what's going on. And by the 19th century, we have uh, Florida has become a uh, United States territory in 1821, a state in 1845. And naturalists and geologists and scientists of all kinds come to this place because it's really the last frontier, right? It's, you know, we think of Nebraska as the frontier. Don't let these people tell you that. The real frontier is here. The real frontier is here. So because it's so different from anything else because all these people are coming from New York and Philadelphia. And so this man, Daniel Brinton, and again, another long titled book, Notes on the Floridian Peninsula, you know, um, comes down here in 1859. He's 22 years old, right? And he, and he does this whole book about Florida, the whole book about Florida and what, what it is and how it's different. And he writes about the springs. And this is what he has to say. The, the geologic formation of Florida gives rise to springs and fountains of such magnitude and beauty that they deserve to be ranked with the great freshwater lakes the Falls of Niagara, and the Mississippi River as grand hydrological features of the North American continent. That's, you know, when you think of Grand Canyon, you usually don't put the Florida Springs in that same thing, but this guy's doing that, right? And he is both an observer and a scientist, which I think is important, right? The most remarkable are the Wakulla, 12 miles from Tallahassee, which he spelled wrong, but that's okay, um, of great death and an icy coldness, which is best known and has been described by the competent pen of Castelnau and others. So other people have described it as well. The Silver Spring and the Manatee Spring. The latter is on the left bank of the Suwannee, 45 miles from its mouth, and is so named from having been a favorite haunt of the sea cow. And Hugh says, I ain't no cow, buddy. So, um, uh, um, whose bones, discovered by the sulfuret of iron held in solution by the water, are still found there. The Silver Spring, in some respects, the most remarkable of the three, is in the center of Marion County, 10 miles from the Ocklawaha, into which its stream flows, and six miles from Ocala. In December 1870, uh, 1856, I had the opportunity to examine it with the aid of proper instruments. It has often been visited as a natural curiosity and is considered by tourists one of the lions of the state. What a great description, right? This is Wakulla, um, now a state park um, just south of Tallahassee. Um, remarkable, it is, is with Silver Springs, the, one of the two largest first magnitude, um, first magnitude springs in the state. Um, and uh, there's, anybody been there? It's pretty amazing, right? And the, the lodge is, used to be the, the home of uh, the 
retreat of a guy named Ed Ball, the, the most uh, unknown power broker in mid central, uh, mid 20th century Florida, and his house is now the, the lodge that's there, right? So that's Wakulla. And this is Manatee, right, on the Suwannee River. Um, these are taken recently, and Manatee looks fairly, looks fairly good, right? So while Daniel Brinton is a scientist and observer, um, this gentleman, Sidney Lanier, is a poet. Um, a poet not in very good stead today. Anybody know why? Because he fought for the Confederacy. And so schools around the state and the region are being, that are named Sidney Lanier, are being renamed. Not the one in Gainesville, however, which is where I taught for 28 years. Um, and Lanier visits Florida, and it's very interesting. You know, you would think that as a poet, he would come down here and extol the virtues of Florida for its idyllic stuff. Yeah, that's true, but he comes here in the pay of the railroad. It's, he's writing a tourist book. Why do you want to come to Florida? Well, you want to come to Florida because it's beautiful, unique, and also, as it said right here, it says to help with consumption. What's, what are consum what's consumption? It's tuberculosis, right? So Florida is a place where you can come and be cured of your illnesses. And the place to do that, obviously, is going to be the springs, right? So he writes significantly about the Oklawaha, calls it the sweetest water lane in the world. And um, Marjorie Harris Carr, when she fights to end the Cross Florida Barge Canal, uh, utilizes the words of Sidney Lanier to you to um, buttress her arguments against building the canal and destroying this wonderful river. So this is what he has to say about Silver Springs. And we'll go to Silver Springs. Um, the picture in the upper right for you guys, that looks pretty much what it looked like when he was there, right, um, in 1876. The fundamental hues of the pool, and man, he writes like a poet, which means tone it down a little bit, right? The fundamental hues of the pool when at rest are distributed into innumerable kaleidoscopic flashes and brilliances. The multitudes of fish become multitudes of animated gems. And this prismatic light seem actually to waver and play through their translucent bodies until the whole spring in a great blaze of sunlight shone like an enormous fluid jewel that without decreasing, forever lapsed upward in successive exhalations of dissolving sheens and glittering colors. A little different in Matt's charts, right? These, you know. Um, so Lanier's vision, at some level, makes Silver Springs the most important tourist attraction in Florida from the 1870s into the 1950s. And what are they marketing? They're marketing Florida and its beauty. Right? And so by the mid 20th century, we've got scientists coming down here, including someone who's mentioned by basically everybody, Howard H.T. Odom, right? Um, and Odom, son of a sociologist from UNC, brother of Eugene Odom, and together these two are basically invent the science of ecology or discover it or examine it. Um, remarkable stuff. And this is Odom writing in 1957. And certainly, you know, the title of his thing is not as poetic as Sidney Lanier. Tropic Structure and Productivity of Silver Springs, right? And so this is what he has to say. By a remarkable circumstance of nature, there are many large springs in central Florida, each with a relatively constant temperature of 21 to 25 degrees centigrade. I ain't no scientist, so I don't know what that means. Anybody help me? What? OK, that's what I thought. That's OK. <laughs> there are many water types, and all contain aquatic communities in their basins and their outflow channels. Because of their special properties, these springs are a giant constant temperature laboratory. So he's going to utilize them. In spite of the actions of the community that tend to modify the water, a constant medium is maintained by the fresh flow from underground. In this rare situation, it is possible to compare whole communities in a ready-made experimental design. You know, really interesting. Then he goes on to talk about other people coming here. He says, when, when Brenton visited the spring, he recorded a boil depth of seven, uh, 41 feet, a temperature of, now, I, 73 degrees, and a main boil discharge of 300 million gallons a day, all similar to what they are now. And now, for him, is 1957, right? Uh, in May 19, 1864, a Confederate soldier, and this is Odom speaking about this, wrote a letter to his wife describing the 
thick carpet of perfectly green grass well under the water. Apparently, the main flowing stream has not, however, been much modified. A long history of permanency, because the assumption is well, it's been over 100 years, right? Everything's, is, of course, no guarantee of a future for when industry and large municipalities locate nearby, large springs cease flow as the demands on the artesian groundwater lower the table. This has already happened. This is 1957, okay? This has already happened in Kissingen Springs in Polk County. And um, I was part of a, a program through the Florida Humanities Council where um, we found people in Polk County who had swum at, swam, swummed at, at, at Kissingen in the 1930s and 40s and brought them out there to what it looked like. That's what it looks like today, but we brought them out there just before the pandemic. They were crying. They were crying because this was a part of their life that is now gone. So not only does he say Kissingen Spring, he says Palmaceus Spring in um, Hillsborough County, along the Hillsborough River. Right? So you can see what it looked like in the 20s and what it looks like today. Not much there. It has been restored um, by the Hillsborough um, Environmental Protection Agency, similar to things that, um, um, that Greg is doing, I think, here uh, in Alachua County. So, so we've seen people in the 18th century. We've seen people in the 19th century. We've seen people in the 20th century. This is Bill Belleville. Um, and Bill was one of the great advocates for springs, um, for natural Florida, um, unfortunately died um, fairly recently, very difficult um, for many of the people who support Florida um, environmental issues to deal with Bill's death. Um, Bill canoed all over the state, kayaked all over the state um, from, his, from his home in Sanford, uh, directed this movie called In Marjorie's Wake, in which um, um, two people, to uh, female environmentalists and, and um, academics uh, traced Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings and um, um, Desi Smith's voyage from the, where the St. John starts down in East Central Florida all the way back up to Cross Creek. And this is what Bill has to say. As a sensitive little kid, I was enthralled with all the mysteries and legends woven into Silver Springs. Where does all this water come from, I wondered? And is that pit really bottomless? I yearned to find out where the darkness between the turquoise waters might lead me. At eight, everything unseen or forbidden was a fairyland of possibility, a place where the imagination could gift you with stories that otherwise would go untold. Silver Springs, after all, is the archetypical Florida theme park, one built around a spectacular natural geographic feature in a time when Florida had little else to sell. And that's what we do, sell it, right? But it's not truly bottomless, nor is its water supply endless. It's a hard lesson that we are now learning throughout Florida as the magnitude of our springs, our major springs decline and our potable water supply ebbs away. Despite the algae, the water is still transparent enough that I can look up through my mask and he's describing he is um, snorkeling, I'm, I'm sorry, scuba diving uh, in the springs. Look up through my mask and make eye contact with a little boy sitting in the glass bottom boat intently looking down at me. His eyes are big, and he seems entranced, pushing his face closer to the glass than the rest. So, you know, these guys uh, tell a remarkable story of uh, human interaction with the springs as both scientific endeavor and as natural beauty. So, you know, um, I'm a teacher, so first question is, what the hell is a spring, right? What is a spring? So, what is a spring? Help me. I don't know. I'm a historian, not a scientist. What's a spring? I mean, okay, so that's great. We're all talking about springs, and not one person here knows what one is, right? That, that's just, I mean, that's just, that's just. Thank you. Thank you. And usually when people answer questions in my class, they get to hold hue, which is good, but, but we're, we're going to forgo that. So, so, you know, when we talk about springs, you know, we see this, this water coming up there, this beautiful um, uh, multicolored water different shades of blue, but we think of it as a discrete entity. And I think one thing um, that I learned when working on the, the book about the Cross Florida Barks Canal is assumptions about um, Silver Springs and its relationship to the Ocklawaha River. Um, in, 19, in late 19th century, the Ocklawaha River and Silver Springs were inextricably intertwined in people's minds. You went to Silver Springs by the river, right? From that great tourist 
destination of Palatka, right? And you, you, went, you went down the Oklahoma, uh, down the Silver to the Spring Boil and back. But when we got the roads, the river became divorced from the spring. And so the spring really became its own thing, right? Associated with Ocala, right? And so I think what we forget is a spring is part of something called a spring shed. And I think that's a term, certainly, and we think of watershed, but a spring shed is all the places that the water percolates down and goes up and comes out of that spring. That's a historian's rather lame description of it, but it tells us that the spring shed is just as important as the spring itself. And in order to protect the spring, we need to protect the spring shed itself, which is kind of difficult. You know, oh my gosh, we're, we have made Blue Springs into a state park. We're good. We're wonderful. It's a state park now. We've saved it. Well, if the spring shed is degraded, guess what? that state park will be degraded as well. So, you know, when we look at springs, North Central Florida has the largest collection of first magnitude springs in the world, right? So it is a remarkable place, and it's a place that is certainly under siege. And, you know, when we talk about water, and, you know, I teach Florida history, I teach Florida environmental history, and we talk about Florida and water, what do we always talk about? The beach, right? We talk about the beach or the big lake, right? Lake Okeechobee. But if you're from North Central Florida, we all talk about the springs. And when you bring students from South Florida out there, you know, they're blown away. They are blown away. And I tell them, you know what? It's different than it was even 10 years ago. I said, if you're blown away now, think how you would have been blown away 15 years ago or 20 years ago. When I first came to the Itchitokne and well before, well, we're not going to say when, but you already, you already know. So that's, and we need to be good stewards of this. And the rest is kind of a, a commercial, you know, kind of like Sydney Lanier, a commercial for saving, right? So, you know, threats to springs, right? And, you know, Matt can argue with this stuff, but certainly, certainly I think that we all realize that whether it's a direct problem, we shouldn't be using all that shit, right? I'm sorry, you know. And keep freshwater habitats healthy, right? And the three Ps, pumping pollution and people. And I think you know, the third thing is really important and really interesting, you know. Oh, sometimes we love these places to death, you know. And I think that that's, you know, and that's really hard. I want to go there and see it. You know, I want to I you know, walk on the spring on the bottom, you know. Really crazy stuff. So we have to be careful. And this is just a great way to look at it. three Ps, right? Saving our springs. And nitrogen reduction, here we are, right, from this. And you know, I got graphs, too, here. So to advance, found the level of nitrates in Wiki Watch. It came back more than twice the level of DEP standards. Now, I'm not sure what that means, but I think we can talk about that. And if it's more than twice the standard, it's probably not what? Normal, right? Now, whether it causes problems or not is another question, but it's not normal. And we all know we love normal, right? Um, problems with overpumping, certainly. And overpumping means taking water out of there. Taking water for what? Taking water so that we can have baths. Taking water so that we can um, have more clean houses, more clean cars, and more lawns, right? So, and it's also for industry and agriculture. You know, Florida has 22 million people, right? In 1940, it had about a million people. Think about that. So all those people need water. So we're over pumping for sure, right? And you know, short of telling people they can't come here, which we may be advocating for, um, it's gonna be a problem, right? And then the obligatory Nestle stuff, right? Which is why we all have our water like this, right? Um, and you know, Jenny Springs, in which Nestle is pumping a million gallons of water out per day, right? And Groups like Merrily's here, you know, take action, break this. You know, and on the other hand, we have this, right? Now, can we take them at their word? You know, I'll just let it to you to decide. But, you know, at some level, they're there and we've got to work with them. I don't know how or why, but yes, we do. So, um, and I've got a whole bunch of then and nows, just like everybody else had. This is um, Gilchrist Blue in only a four-year period, right? This is Itchitokne, John Moran's pictures. 
probably the same ones that we've seen already. This is sulfur springs, um, which, which we did not look at. This is um, if we drive down to Tampa on I-275, and, and just before you get to downtown, after you get to USF on the, on the left-hand side, um, there's this strange tower. That's the water tower for Sulphur Springs. Right? And Sulphur Springs was this remarkable place of um, public recreation into the 1930s and 40s. Today, that's algae and everything else, no swimming. It's a mess. Um, the city of Tampa is desperately trying to restore this so, um, so that it can be, um, again, a place of recreation. Probably not a place to swim, but it, um, it's problematic at best, right? Um, White Springs, part of the Stephen Foster State Park uh, along the Suwannee River in 1900. It was one of those places that people came, like Sidney Lanier said, to take the waters for cures, right? Um, you can see the spring house built there. Hundreds of people came. It was among Florida's largest tourist attractions, money-making enterprise. You can see what it looks like now. There's very little water there. Um, and these pictures really point out the stark level of how degraded White Springs has become. Silver River, again, you can see the difference. And again, not too far long ago, 1990, right? And Warm Mineral Springs, which is, a, anybody ever been there? It's a really interesting place. Huh? It's, in, it's in Northport, which is bizarrely in the south part of Sarasota County. Um, and unlike most springs, which have a temperature of what, Matt? 73. 73. This is 86, right? This is 86. Um, and people go there for health, right? For health, warm mineral springs. Supposedly, the mineral content and the and, and the um, and the um, the mineral content and the temperature of the water makes them particularly arthritis. And Bob and I are going to go there to to deal with our knee replacement stuff. So, um, but the crazy thing is, you know, in in the 1950s, they built all this junk around. Uh, the, you know, on these buildings, which are all falling apart, and this round thing is is a um, a museum supposedly for Hernanda, uh, for Juan Ponce de Leon, because this is where the Fountain of Youth really was. <laughs> so just wild stuff, right? Wild stuff. And then you know um, that this great word, this great word, which just you know, not just activism, but kayaktivism. Right? Great. I, I, that that term is just fabulous. Huh? And you know, steps you can take, reduce your water use. And certainly, the assumptions are by reducing water use, you have to what? Change your lifestyle drastically, you know? Well, one place that really worked on changing um, water usage is maybe the most conservative county in Florida. And I realize that every county in Florida vies for that title, right? Um, and Sarasota, Sarasota County, you know, extraordinarily high, um, high um, level of living. And you know, they're not about to have somebody tell them to you know, do this and cut water supply. Well, they worked on getting low flow toilets. And their water usage dropped during that first two decades of the 20th century, even though there's more people there. And nobody's life suffered. Because, because people are not willing to, oh my god, I'm not, don't take this away from me. So if we can make it so that there's not that much sacrifice, we can really do something. You know, grow native, cut the chemicals. Again, septic systems, again, the biggest problem. And new septic systems are, are going to be better. But a lot of people have old septic systems, can't afford to fix them. So government in, uh, helping them to, to update their septics is really important. Get involved with organizations fighting for change, like our Santa Fe, right? Talk to your representative. They won't listen, but talk to them. Talk to them, and talk to them, and talk to them. The great story about, and I've heard this from more than one per person, um, about Marjorie Harris Carr. And all these people would say, you know, older men now, and said, man, I made sure that when Har Mar Marjorie Harris Carr was near to take my tie off, because when she went to talk to me about saving the Oklahoma and taking down that, uh, taking down that dam, they, she would grab me by that tie and not let me go. So may, may, maybe we can get part of that, right? 
stay informed and share your knowledge, and most importantly, vote. Most importantly, vote, right? You know, be sure to vote, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I got this great picture. Sorry I don't have you, Matt. Sorry I don't have you, Greg, but yeah. Um, at at um, Rum Island, right? At Rum Island. Um, recently, I, and this is from an, art, uh, an article in the Tampa paper that they did, right? Which is just nice. So yeah, there's our boy, you know, things, there's our boy Hugh paddling down there, you know. Um, Earth Day, been a nice thing to do. I remember um, on Earth Day with my two kids, um, we went and cleaned up, um, cleaned up the, the um, Hogtown Creek and its outflow from, um, from um, Glen Springs. And you know, amazing, the stuff that we found in there. But it, you know, all that little bit helps, right? And Nature Conservancy, protect and restores waters. And certainly government agencies can help. This is um, Swift Mud, which is a water management district of, of southwest Florida, which expresses all the way from Brooksville southward, right? That's amazing. And um, they're trying to restore this stuff at, um, at Three, Three Sisters Spring and Crystal River. And the basic reason it's been, it, it's been degraded is because so many people are there to watch Hughes Buddies, right? So hopefully this will help it out, right? And all this stuff, save our springs. And I'm gonna end with um, spring break. Right? So for spring break this year, my son and granddaughter came down from Atlanta. My daughter-in-law, of course, being a teacher, had to work because her spring break is different, right? And so they, they went to um, Silver Springs, and this is when they went in the fall, and um, Dorothy got to see a manatee <laughs> underneath the glass bottom boat, which tells us, you know, that things are not as bad as we think they are. Oh my God, there's manatees there. How do they get there? Which means they have to travel through the Oklahoma, past that dam, right? But they're managing to do it, which is remarkable. So, you know, my son took this picture and my, my granddaughter loved this thing. You know, it's just, it's wonderful. And then over spring break, we went to Gilchrist Blue, right? um, took the picture there. We went canoeing out on the, down the spring run and um, out into the Santa Fe, down past Rome Island, almost to where Naked Ed used to live, right? And um, it was remarkable. And she was like, oh my God, this is great. I love this. The water is so beautiful. I've got to go to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> you know, so we had to turn around. But, but um, we'll end with this and... Um, this is her and my son swimming in the, um, in the boil itself, and that's what it looks like. Um, and my goal here is to hope that my granddaughter's granddaughter will be able to experience what my granddaughter did with me two weeks ago. Um, I realized that certainly what she saw in 2023 was not what I saw in 1974, but it's still amazing. So um, Bruce Springsteen, which I think is a great name for someone talking about springs, um, from a song called, um, Does This Bus Stop at 82nd Street? Um, and if it's in Gainesville, the answer is no, 75th. But um, man, the dope that the, the dope's that there's still hope. So you know, in spite of everything, there's still hope. And Mother Jones, anybody know who Mother Jones is? Man, you work at the, at the institute here with all these people to the wall and you don't know who Mother Jones is? I thought you graduated. <laughs> man, if you didn't, man, I'd have failed you. Mother Jones is a activist, um, woman labor organizer in the coal fields of, of West Virginia and all over um, in the first two decades of the 20th century. And um, she puts this as she's about to die, don't mourn, organize. So don't mourn what's happening out there, organized to prevent it from getting worse. Thank you. What a phenomenal series of presentations. Let's give everybody a round of applause again. So I now ask a four panelists to join me on the stage to begin the Q&A portion of the event. Thank you.
All right, so the way that this is going to work is that I'm going to ask um, two questions. I want, if, um, if possible, I would like every single one of you guys to answer. Then I will take questions from the audience. I've already collected a couple, but uh, if need be, I will have um, one person, um, I will open the floor to um, the audience members for questions. Um, if, other than the first two, I'm going to ask you, um, feel free if everyone, um, to answer the questions. Feel, ha, each one of you... If one of you guys want to take the question individually, or if, every, or if every single one of you guys wants to answer, just feel free to take the questions as, as they are, as that makes any sense. So to begin with, I would like to first ask you guys, it, um, what is the most direct um, way we can help the Springs? And if you can begin by answering that question. Uh, the most direct way is to have a whole new uh, political system in Florida right now. Uh, I mean, and I didn't, I didn't re read that part of my presentation. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's really sad. We have uh, a government that is not interested in actually providing a future for our environment. And even though that's the, one of the most important parts of Florida is, is recreation, tourism, and a healthy environment, we're not going to have that the way we're going right now. And water is, uh, they pretend to be interested, but they're not interested. And th this has been going on for a long time, but it just seems to get worse and worse. So that's, that's what I would say. Uh, these, I, I do want to say that these problems are all solvable. The springs will recover as soon as we pump less groundwater and as soon as we do something about nitrate. Nitrate's not the only problem, obviously. But um, we need to pump a lot less groundwater, about less than half of what we're pumping right now. And we can do that. I've got a book, my new book on saving Florida Springs back there. I've, I lay out, we need cisterns, we need to use rainwater and we need to stop using our precious groundwater to water grass and, and yards and things like that. Yeah, I think when we frame this question, we, we really have to think about how we approach it. And lots of times we're pointing fingers at each other. It's agriculture or it's the bottling plant. And I feel that we're, we're really all in this together. So when we think about this, it's, it's going to take everybody. And if, if you're at home, you have a yard, like Bob was saying, we need to replace those yards. We need to normalize having a yard of, of weeds or a springs, you know, friendly yard. springs friendly yards. I mean, we, we had a campaign, we're doing campaigns where one of the, one of the ideas we have was like, oh, we're going to legal, we want legalized weeds. I don't think that's going to, maybe that one won't fly, but if we can have, you know, if you can be accepting of, of pine straw, you go to look at my yard as pine straw. All, all that water usage that we use, over half of it is, is on our lawns. So that's a, that's a low-hanging fruit that we can capture in order to provide more for, for, this, for the springs. Yeah, so my uh, son, for his eighth grade science fair project, asked the question about how the things that we eat impact the environment around us. And uh, what he concluded was that the water use that we focus on, like the turn off the tap when you brush your teeth, like those are easy because they're very like visceral and immediate, but that the biggest thing you could do to reduce your water consumption was to alter your diet. Um, whether or not there's any leverage for that in sort of public discourse or whether there's any leverage for changing the government wholesale as Bob would like to see, like, I don't know, I'm a scientist. The things that I would like to, that, that for me, the sort of most direct way that I can influence the discourse about Springs is to try to, you know, solve the puzzles that are out there, the things that don't make sense, the ways in which we are, I think, remain confused about the, the best ways to be stewards of the resource. And so that may not be your journey, I'll just, so I'm sort of speaking for myself, but that is to try to, to be a, a committed empiricist, so. Well, I, I totally agree with the changing your lawn habit. Um, that would probably be the biggest impact, I mean, immediately that you can do as a as a person on your own individually. Our Santa Fe River even at Rum 138 created a, uh, a garden that is all native. Uh, once the plant roots are established, there's no watering. And those native plants actually increase habitat also. Um, so changing your garden, like, like uh, Greg just said, um, changing your landscape and what that is also will will certainly help water. Um, lawns are the biggest consumers as far as you individually now, as as that goes. Get rid of HOAs, because <laughs> because because HOAs HOAs particularly in South Florida 
will not allow the things that you guys are talking about, right? Oh my God, you want to get rid of your lawn? You, you know, you're a communist, right? And we don't, and we don't allow communists in Florida. So um, I think you know, convincing people that lawns like that are acceptable, appropriate, and beautiful, right? Because there's this beauty vision of what what a beautiful house should look like. I think the other thing is working through IFAS to get agriculture to use water more efficiently. I mean, we're, you know, everybody agrees we need agriculture, right? And agriculture is the largest uses, use of water in the state, as it should be. But they waste a lot of stuff. You know, you may waste stuff on your lawn, but they waste a lot of stuff. And IFIS is working with them, um, again, to try to use water more efficiently. But boy, that's hard. I mean, old habits die hard. And my grandfather would farm this land and, and my father farmed this land in the same way. Um, trying to convince these people that um, it's important. And certainly tying that into things like understanding that losing water leads to things like saltwater intrusion, which ain't good for your plants, buddy, right? So, you know, getting them to understand that and working with them, I think, is, is really important. And I think the other thing is getting people out. You know, um, my, my in-laws, my um, sister-in-law and brother-in-law moved uh, to uh, a uh, retirement community south of Ocala, not the villages. So, <laughs> um, and they became enthralled with the springs you know so they go all over the place and they say nobody in that place has visited anywhere you know just, just and so just getting if you see the springs if you see them you will become an advocate mm -hmm. so getting them out there you know and certainly you know my classes I, you know, we talk about this and the vision Images help, and not just pictures. Pictures are nice, but getting them out there and seeing that is remarkable. And I guess the second question for me is, discuss the role that agriculture has in Spring Health. Dis <laughs> Our culture? Agriculture, sir. Oh, agriculture? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I sort of disagree with some of the other answers. The, the problems are large, very large. We're pumping close to 4 billion gallons a day of groundwater that should be coming out of the springs. We need to cut that back. If we, if we want to have healthy springs, and this is research I've been working on my, most of my life, we need to have about 95% of the original average flows. And the only way to get there is to reduce our pumping by well over half. So that means going to agriculture and saying, and, and your grandfather and whoever your father weren't using groundwater for irrigation 50 years ago, 40 years ago. There was no groundwater being used for irrigation. They grew their crops in places where they could use surface water and rainfall. But that's not the way it is now. And agriculture is increasing its footprint every year, putting in more center pivot irrigation systems and making the problem worse. So little things actually, like lawns, I mean, you can't solve this problem yourself. As I indicated, about 90% of the problem is with about 30,000 corporations and people, 90%. So if you turn off the water while you're brushing your teeth, it's not gonna help. I mean, it helps a little bit, but it's minuscule. It's not, not gonna solve the problems. So agriculture's a big part of the problem. Yeah, I think with springs, this is one of those wicked problems that it's, it really is gonna take the collaboration of everybody and agriculture, actually agriculture usage was surpassed by public supply recently. If you look at the USGS report, public supply, we're using more water than agriculture in the latest in the state of Florida. We all need food to eat, we all need water to drink, but I think you know we're in this all together. There's, there's gonna have to be some major land use changes um, in order to, provide more water yield at the springs. And Matt will probably like to talk about this a little more, but when you're looking at the water budget, the evapotranspiration, that's a huge component of it. So if, if there's more plants, there's more ET, like how are we gonna get more water yield? Are we gonna replace some of that, those agriculture fields with solar farms or something that we can allow more recharge? Or individually, we're gonna make choices. I do Meatless Monday, so it's great. You're thinking about that. Maybe we can get everybody to, th I, I think we all need to think about this together and maybe turning your water off while you brush your teeth 
isn't really impactful, but I think as, as we approach this collaboratively, that's, that's how we're gonna have that sort of restoration. Yeah, I should have said that my son's project, one of the statistics that he found, my favorite one actually, was that if every resident of Gainesville reduced their consumption of meat, like re eliminated meat one day a week, we would save collectively in terms of the water necessary to produce those commodities, the, a water footprint equivalent to the flow of the Ishituckney River. Think about that for a second. It's astronomical. He, he calculated it, and I double calculated and didn't. Anyways, I think that's right. And so it really suggests that some of our personal consumption patterns, we're all consumers of food. Agriculture is producing the commodities that we eat. It's an ecosystem, and we can't necessarily sort of decompartmentalize it. I would say that there's a lot of opportunities for agriculture, like as Steve mentioned, to be uh, cajoled, incentivized into reduced um, water consumption via efficiency, lower, lowering their, their, the, the uh, water consumption via those center pivots. There's programs out there, and they, if you look at the USGS water consumption statistics as your reference, the consumption from agriculture is declining. And so whether you, I mean, maybe those are, you know, there's, there's always dispute in statistics, but I think that those are important observations is that there is actually a lot of capacity to reduce water consumption, particularly when it's, when it's motivated by sort of technological interventions, uh, smart irrigation systems that don't turn the, the irrigation system on when it just rained, for example. Um, and I think that those similar kinds of things we've been talking about, you know, urban lawns, my wife and I are um, committed to using a watering can to just use, you know, irrigate our fruit trees and whatnot. Um, and I think, you know, the state of Florida has been progressively moving in that direction in ways that, that should confer some hope upon us, that per capita water consumption has been declining in the state since 1980. Right, and so we are finding ways. Part of that is the build-out effect. People have smaller lawns, um, but part of it is also the kind of programs that Greg and and Mary Lee are talking about, educating the public about the their their water footprint. And I th so I think. I would not point the finger directly at agriculture. We are all food consumers. I saw food moving around. Maybe we'll be food consumers very shortly. And so it's very important, I think, not to be sort of pointing the finger and asserting that there are good guys and bad guys in this argument. I think, as Greg said, it becomes most, we're most constructive when we try to find common ground. And I think um, water consumption is a very easy, uh, easy way to find that. Well. Um being in that area of ag world when Fort White, um, surrounded by farmers, um, and, and talking to farmers one-on-one um, -on -one and finding out how they're reducing their, their, their water use, uh, they are doing advanced technology and they are, doing, they are reducing. There's something that um, is more heinous in a lot of ways, and that's mining. Uh, mining in the state of Florida brought down uh, one of the springs already that was seen in, in one of these videos. So uh, mining uh, on the ridge, on Trail Ridge, between uh, our side of Florida and Jacksonville side of Florida, Camores is discharging 72 million gallons of wasted water. So that gives you an idea on how much water they use a day. Uh, it's polluting the areas downstream. That's a whole other story. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. And then uh, Nutrien up in Hamilton County is using it a substantial amount. I think it's 64 million. I forget what they're at right now uh, a day. Um, those water uses, not only are they uh, using water that is changing uh, that, that it, this, is it called pentometric divide, that, that water di pen, yeah, the water divide between us and Jacksonville, I believe it is the reason. Uh, even though Jacksonville has a lot of water that they use as a city municipality, that mining is, is, is even more. And, and no one's talking about that. And, and I think that really needs to be discussed, deforestation. Um, uh, also needs to be discussed. The more that we cut down the trees, the less water that's getting into our groundwater system. Uh, when it's hot out, it is just hot, and that, that, that trans evaporation is happening. When it's shaded, it's keeping it down, and it's also carbon sequestering also. Uh, the other thing, um, um, well, there's one more water use that, um, well, anyway, I'll leave it at that, the mining and the deforestation. Uh, the gyp stacks are another issue altogether um, because they want to use, uh, it's, 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 it's a problem, but in terms of water use, what, what we're talking about right now, um, it's the consumption of water use for mining that is a problem, and it's also polluting people downstream and killing them. I'm fine. Okay. So I'll take um, two questions from the audience. Um, but yes. Yeah. 
Thanks. I just have a quick question. So you talked about mining. Do you specifically mean phosphate mining for phosphogypsum or other types of mining as well? Yes, phosphate mining is one of them. The other mining that's happening on the ridge is for titanium and rare earth. So all of these phones that we have, all of the technology that we have is actually being mined right out of Florida. And so people have to be aware that what you use, talk about food, <laughs> we have to use less technology in one way or another or remind, uh, mine the dumps. That's what I'd really like to see happen and remine these materials that we're holding in our hands that are made of the mining issues that we are dealing with, not only from water consumption, but also from poisons that we have to deal with downstream. So um, titanium, rare earth, and phosphate. Just a little more answer. Uh, I agree that, um, new, new, what's there? New, uh, they are the reason why springs stop flowing. I mean, they are the biggest responsible party for that. But that's the drawdown in the aquifer is also happening because of Jacksonville, which is pumping a lot more water than nutrient is. Jacksonville is pumping about 100 million gallons a day, and Gainesville is pumping about 20 million gallons a day. So there's a whole regional potentiometric drawdown in northeast Florida that actually is partly affected by um, uh, paper mills up in Georgia as well. But nutrient's the one closest. Kissingen Springs that uh, Steve talked about uh, dried up because of phosphate mining. There was no doubt about it at all. And the Water Management District prepared a report on that back in the 70s, and everybody knew what drew it down is because they had beautiful graphs showing the reduced flow with the increased water consumption and phosphate mining down there. That's continuing. And Kissingen Springs will never flow unless the phosphate mining goes away from Central Florida. So that's, that's a good question. They're not the only bad guy, but uh, phosphate mining is very water intensive. So for the interest of time, we'll ask our final question. This one's from Zoom. Um, discuss the role that herbicides are having on the health of Florida Springs. Discuss the role that herbicides are having on the health of Florida Springs. I, I don't have much to say about it. Uh, herbicides are not, I mean, some are getting into the aquifer. We just uh, completed a study on Santa Fe, and, and we found some atrazine and uh, some other herbicides. But they're not really high concentrations for the most part. A lot of that's being attenuated. Um, so I don't know that herbicides are a big problem in the springs. At least that's my information. Matt may have other yeah, it's definitely not my area of expertise. I just have an anecdote. So my wife and I were married at, at McCullough Springs. At, we rented out the Edward Ball Lodge, and we spent three days there before and after the wedding just cruising around McCullough Springs, and it was just amazing. I mean, maybe it was just because I'd just gotten married, but I was, I was <laughs> on cloud nine, and it was, it was, it was sort of you know, the, the miracle of nature that Steve was talking about. And I went back. It was probably 10 years later. We were married in 2000, 2010, and the submerged aquatic vegetation was gone. And so I was talking to the park biologist what had happened. And it was, there's a, like so many things in nature, a constellation of events, and there's some, you know, some maybe reasonable people can disagree about it. But what, they, what he said was, was that the application of sonar in the spring run was responsible. They're sort of like trying to control hydrilla led to the killing of everything. That's an anecdote and it's secondhand, but I think it's important. You know, I remember um, working with, uh, folks on the Ishtuckney pulling water lettuce. Um, and, uh, and the notion that this, because it was a state park, we weren't going to apply herbicide. But in other places, we apply herbicide for water hyacinth, for hydrilla, and for water lettuce. And, and oftentimes, I feel like that the, the, the cure is worse than the disease. And so in terms of the, the broadcast spraying directly for the control of, of nuisance vegetation in our waterways, I think, I think that, takes, that requires a good, long, hard look. Um. Yeah, um, our Santa Fe River did get involved with uh, FWC biologists um, that were spraying the Santa Fe River. We haven't seen that happen uh, in years. Um, and then the farmers around us that might be using herbicides, there is a question that I think I've heard at Ginny Springs whether or not that's responsible for reducing the amount of plant vegetation that's in the river. I don't think they've confirmed exactly if that's the reason for it, but we do not see the eel or the, the tape grass and the sag grass like we used to. Used to be you used to go down the river and it would be all over your boat, all over your butt if you're in a tube. That's not happening anymore. So that, that, um, that vegetation uh, has not returned since we had the floods of 2012, and I don't think that's from 
uh, the, the herbicides, but the herbicides are interesting because now we have so many solar fields. We have five located right north of the Santa Fe River, large uh, solar fields. As you know, they're, they're, I think, under 75 megawatts or whatever the, the ruling is to have a solar farm that doesn't have to have certain permitting conditions. Uh, and so uh, there is a, a request that we've put forward when we've met the solar farmers um, that they would use sheep. Uh, instead of herbicides, because we are concerned that that'll be an extra uh, nutrient load that we didn't experience uh, when they were just fallow fields or when they were empty fields. So uh, it, it's a good question, and I don't know the answer. But no. Electro County has done some sampling for herbicides and pesticides, and we're not seeing it really in the in the groundwater and private wells that we've sampled, but it, it is in our surface water. So we have seen some low level um, very low level detections, and then some that are just real detections that we're seeing in our creeks around here. We have had a question of like, are we just missing an event at the springs? Like, does it come out as a slug and we're just missing when it comes? So it, it is something that I would like to examine a little more, um, but I think it's a question that's still out there. Absolutely, and I think that ends the Q&A portion of the event. Let's give everybody a round of applause. Thank you all so much again for this wonderful panel. I invite everybody for uh, a brief lunch. Um, there should be sandwiches and chips and, everything, and all these other goodies right around the corner. Um, the lunch will be about 20 minutes, and then afterward, the workshop portion of the event will begin. So thank you. Good to see you, man. Yeah, nice to see you. Guys, can we get a picture of the other? I'll get some of you. Putting in some tag grant applications. Yeah, this next month we were just getting all our ones completed for this last year. It was such a short period. Yeah, I know. Was, I put mine in yeah. on Friday. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to put some in April. Yeah, not great. Yeah, but our last one was in yesterday. That one does really good. So, from 95 to 2013, where do you want us to stand?